Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this uh, second breakout session, customer success session of today. My name is Herbert Blankenstein. I'm an IT journalist, and my job is today to conduct the interviews with uh, entrepreneurs at this breakout sessions concerning customer success. And my next guest will be Philip Corvelein. He's an, uh, a disruptor and he works at Tools, Tools for Legal, which is a company he founded himself. Please, Philip Corvelein, ladies and gentlemen. Hi. Hi. Please sit down. Thank you. Tools for Legal, the name gives me an idea of what you do, mm -hmm. but maybe you can explain it yourself at best in full. Uh, well, in, in short, uh, what Tools for Legal does is it's a Frankfurt-based startup company that um, re-engineers uh, legal workflows uh, and mainly aimed at uh, legal work that's being done within larger corporations. All right, but that's still, to me, being a non-legal uh, expert, uh, that's a bit vague. So, um, can you be more precise? What's the problem you are trying to uh, attack? Well, let's just say that um, the, me and my, my co-founder, Felix Rakwitz, we are both um, lawyers by background. And mm -hmm. um, uh, we've been practicing law for quite a long time, um, 12, 15 years. And our experience as lawyers was basically that um, as lawyers working in, in business law, working for larger corporations, the issues you often face is that um, we tend to think as lawyers that we are hugely important and, and the law is really important and clients uh, tend to disagree, uh, but we don't get that. And often clients say, well, basically, I have an issue, I've got a business problem in my business and I need some legal support on that. And then we dive into the law and really fascinated by whatever all the options might be. Yeah. Uh, but that's not necessarily what the client wants. So the issue there would be, how do I get more efficient legal services for uh, a corporation that's, for example, um, working in more than one country in Europe, which is the client base we're, we're aiming at. Um, and essentially, I think the problem is best, um, best summarized as follows. When you look at the business model of what law firms do, a law firm basically says, I've got 10, 15, 20 bigger law firms have 500, 1,000 lawyers on their payroll. And the way they make money is by making all these lawyers work as many hours as possible. Because that's the business model. I work 1,000, 2,000 hours a year times X amount per hour. And this is how I make my money. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, on the, on the demand side, you've got your clients, and these clients want efficient legal advice. And so these two meet in the marketplace, and the lawyer wants to sell as many hours as he can, and the, lawyer, and the client wants to get advice really quickly. Yeah. Now, how do you solve that? Because if the client says... Isn't that a conflict in all business, that the seller wants to sell as much as possible, and the buyer wants only what he needs? Absolutely, that's, that's a very common so what's issue. what's the difference? Well, I think in this case, because the simple business model of a law firm says that if the client wants you to be more efficient, then there's two things you can do. You can sell less hours or you can lower your hourly rate. Yeah. Basically, immediately, it has an impact on your profit line. Whereas if I'm a, a regular business, if I become more efficient in my internal workings, I tend to bring down my cost base and increase my profit. That's not happening with lawyers. But there's something about power as well, maybe. The, the lawyer um, has the power to tell the client, uh, you need more of my hours. Well, that's the black box that you often face as a client, is because you've got all of these things going on in your business. You, know, you have to manage a lot of things. And you're asking questions to your lawyers, and these might be lawyers in Italy, in France, in Spain, Germany, Netherlands, mm -hmm. wherever they are, and you get your answers back. And so you've, you, you're basically trying to get that input, but you don't have always the time to figure out all of the detail. You want clear-cut answers. Uh, you're not always getting those. And the problem we face, and I, I know from experience as a lawyer myself, is you get the client question in, and then from the client's perspective, it's a bit of a black box. I've asked you a question, and then maybe in a week's time, maybe if it's urgent, in a day or two, you get an email back or you get a memo back. And you have no idea how much hours the lawyer has really you worked for you. have no clue whatsoever. And, uh, you know, we always say, if you order a pair of socks on Amazon, 
you know exactly what it costs, you know exactly where it is, and you know exactly when you're going to get it. When you order, and that's maybe five pounds or five euros you spend on socks. If you buy a memo from a reputable law firm for 10,000 euros, you have no idea who's working on it, when you're going to get it, what's going to be in it, and whether it's actually going to be useful to you. Maybe and you can't send it back. Maybe it was an apprentice doing the work for you have zero Well, you have, no, you have no idea. Yeah. You have no idea. And this is one part of the problem. The other part of the problem is that when you're working as a lawyer, um, if you would work, you know, at best six, seven hours a day, ten hours a day, out of those six to ten hours a day you work, if, if three to four hours are really legal work, you've done a really good job. The other part of what you're doing is basically admin, process, project management, it's, it's chasing up facts, it's fact-finding, it's conversations, it's calls, it's not really legal work. So what the client is usually paying for is a bit of legal expertise and a lot of other things. And where we say is, well, that lot of other things is mostly project and process driven. And there, with technology, and basically what Mendix provides as well as a platform, that's a perfect match. Yeah, so we're getting to that, but how, how are you solving this? Well, the way we solve it is by, by, looking, at, um, by looking at what's going on, really. What's the problem? There's a, there's a, a very nice example of, a, of a, uh, an accounting software developed 80s, 90s, Inuit, um, who called it the uh, follow me home technique. Um, and instead of thinking out of the black box or going on to the attic and trying to think of what is now the, the perfect solution that we can develop, um, you go out and sit next to the client and see what they actually do. Because you can ask people to describe a process. You can ask them to say, what do you do? And most often the description will not even match the reality of what they actually do. So we tend to go out and sit next to clients and see what they actually do. Who do they interact with? What kind of information do they get? Why do they get it? So we look at the process and then decompose but it. That's not legal work, it. is it? Or is it? It's not legal work, no. Now, so the basics of what we do is we look at what is actually legal and what is process. Mm -hmm. And so the process part we put into technology and that supports, and the legal part for that we engage lawyers wherever they might be needed. So we essentially okay. provided a, a hybrid service of a technology-enabled legal service uh, where we have our own expert uh, network of lawyers throughout Europe. We currently, I think, have um, we are operational in 21 countries in Europe in, and, and in South Africa recently. And what happens is basically client can go onto our portal, onto our online platform, and instruct a type of work. And then will Amazon or whatever kind of FedEx or UPS style follow what's going on. He will have an immediate transparency in what's going on. And we work on a fixed cost basis. So the client prepays but knows exactly what's going on, when he's going to get it. And this okay. is a very, very so, successful formula. So it's formula. a fixed price. It's a fixed price formula, yeah. And it's attractive for you to do your job in as little time as possible instead of in as much time as possible. So essentially, we've, we've turned around the business model of what law firms do, where law firms try to maximize the number of hours. We try to minimize the legal work that needs to be done. But there's always going to be legal work to be done, and that has to be quality driven. So where the margin is, is in the project driven part. So uh, the better we get at making that process more efficient, the more money we, we tend to make. Um, and as for the, the, the other part is uh, automating the process uh, uh, driven stuff. Um, why hasn't anybody ever thought of that before? It sounds like a very, very straightforward idea. Well, there's, there's, there's lots, of, lots of these things written about, about the legal industry, which, which is often described as one of those last standing fortresses of, of all traditional working. Um, I think a lot of, a lot of lawyers... Um, where people fax and all that. Well, yeah, they, well, people still reminisce about the days where they could use a fax, right? Yeah. It, it's, it's, um, uh, it's an industry where where uh, I think a lot of the, the ways of working are still very much the same as they were 50 years ago, except now they use email instead of a, instead of a pen or a typewriter. Yeah. Uh, but essentially the work, how they do the work and how they manage the work is still very much the same. Um, and this is why this is, this is very much an industry up for what they then typically or, or more popularly call disruption. Uh, we call it, you know, it, it, it has much more to do with service innovation. How can you innovate the way in which you deliver services? Um, Richard Susskind is one of those authors that's written a lot about how innovation works in the legal industry. Um, and he often describes the dilemma why nobody's really doing anything 
uh, from the traditional law firm industry about this. And he says, it's very difficult to convince a glup of millionaires to change their business model. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's typically the case. You know? um, as a lawyer, you stand to make a lot of money uh, if you do this well. Um, your only incentive is to make more money, which is sell more hours. Um, where is your incentive then to turn that around as long as the client is still happy and there's no real other alternative for the client to go to? This is where we say this is a gap in the market where we can jump in and provide that real alternative. Are you the only company that works according to this model for a fixed price? We're certainly not the only company. We are certainly the only company that does this on a European level, that provides solutions that work for companies across the European borders. Right. Would you describe yourself as an Uber for law? That would be too much honor, I think. <laughs> <laughs> we're, certainly not, we're certainly not at that stage yet. We're 18 months old, um, and it's going, it's going really well. It's going fast, but I don't think we're, we're the Uber of, 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 of law. Uh, we'll leave that honor to someone else uh, if they want to pick up that honor. I think what, what drives us really is we come from the industry. We understand the intricate issues that this industry faces. And we're really passionate about how can we rethink this? How can we actually go back to clients that we used to serve and say to them, you know, there's a real alternative and it actually works. And it's technology enabled. And how fast are you growing now? Um, well, when we started uh, January last year, uh, it was just me and Felix sitting in a small office in Frankfurt. Um, and when I look now, we've got 15 people and we've basically doubled our revenues um, uh, in less than a year's time. So it's, it's, growing, it's growing really fast. We were operational. We started working in Germany, the Netherlands, and Belgium in February last year. And now we cover um, 21 countries in Europe and, and South Africa. Okay. Too much growth can be a bad thing too. Is that an Absolutely. issue for you? Um, well, uh, it is an issue in, in, in the sense that we need to be careful about how we grow. Um, how? how we grow. Uh, we have a clear focus on what we want to do and what kind of products we want to deliver. Um, and what absolutely is important for us is the client satisfaction and the client quality. Uh, we won't make any compromises on that. So if growing fast means that this might be compromised in whatever way, shape or form, then we will politely decline. Uh, we've, we've got basically... Do you do that often? Not often, decline. but we do it. We do it, absolutely we do, because I think one of the major issues we face is that it's very new. And lawyers, by training and by nature, I think, I don't really know what follows what, are really conservative in their way of thinking. And changing that takes some time. And usually, when a lawyer transfers from a law firm to an in-house position and becomes a, a company lawyer, um, that kind of behavior keeps going because their task is essentially to man manage the risk within the company. So shifting from uh, knowing what you know, which is working with law firms, to a new type of service provider is not an easy thing. So for us, it's very essential that whenever a client changes, he can be sure that that is never going to affect the quality and the service levels. And actually, when we look at, we, because we provide really clear measurable outcomes of what we do, yeah. um, We've recorded with one of our uh, US multinationals um, for whom we work in 20 countries um, that they actually spend 60% less time on managing the work they used to do, uh, which has now been taken care of by our platform. They brought down their cost by more than 30% and they hit all of their deadlines, all of them, which wasn't the case before. So I think we can clearly show measurable results and this is clearly what drives us forward. Yes. Um, you told me just now that uh, a, a, a prospective customer can uh, leave their assignment on a web interface mm -hmm. and the work gets done for a fixed price, but how is the price determined? Uh, that's a very good question and it's part of, it's part of some of it we can, we can disclose, some of it we can't disclose, but there's... <laughs> uh, there's In that case, it's really a good question. <laughs> yeah. there's, there's, some, there's some intricate, um, um, more complex calculations that, that have to be done, but... Um, Let's, let's, let's just give a very concrete example. So one of the applications we developed was the following. Um, when you have a multinational company, you've got seats of operations in, in various countries. Yeah. One of the most boring, but really rather important things to get done is making sure that all of your corporate secretary work is done. What, what does that mean? That means that you have 
all of your annual shareholder meetings held in time with the right documents signed off by the right people. When you change your board members, your directors, your auditors in the company that that's done in time right, a lot of these companies also steer their operations locally through individual powers of attorney. Uh, how, who has banking powers, uh, who can sign checks in Italy, for what, what amount. That becomes quite, quite quickly a quite complex network of assignments and assignments that have been given. Um, that usually, from a legal perspective, is not rocket science. It's very simple. But in terms of managing it, that takes up a lot of time. A lot of it is process. Mm -hmm. So there we can, we can come in with a technology solution that takes care of the process bit so that everybody else can just focus on what, what's legally important. Now, how does that work in pricing? Because we cover the whole of Europe, we have an idea on what exactly uh, a shareholder meeting should cost in Italy or in the Netherlands, or in, in Germany. And there's, there's huge differences. In the Netherlands, it's really fast, really straightforward, really simple. And so if we would do this service only in the Netherlands, I think what we would do would be more or less redundant or not just really adding real value. Mm -hmm. um, in Italy, however, um, might not be a surprise, it takes quite a lot more. <laughs> lots of documents, lots of stamps, lots of notaries that need to be involved. Um, and you might even want to have to go and have a cappuccino with the local filing uh, agent to get your documents filed. Um, so it takes a lot more time and therefore it costs a lot more money. Because we average it out and because our product is not driven by selling hours but by selling service based on a fixed yeah. price, it's, it's, a volume, it's a volumes game. So because we can offer uh, and we have quite a lot of volume in Italy, in Spain, and all of the other countries, we can actually average out the price. And so the client pays a fixed price, and we know exactly what level we can offer to make it for us profitable and still bring down the cost for the client. Yeah, but um, offering your services at a fixed price involves some risk, I guess. Does it ever happen that you uh, determine a price and you turn out to have to work a lot more and uh, work at a loss? Uh, that's actually calculated in. There's there's quite okay. a there's so quite margin. a complex there's quite complex there's a quite complex calculation, um, and what they call um, um, uh, chance. Uh, it has to do with chance statistics. Mathematics, statistics exactly yeah. probability. Okay. Yeah. How much you can deviate, um, and in in that in that to that extent actually, um, we're doing quite well. And the nice okay. thing is that we can actually turn a profit. We've been profitable from day one and still realize 30 to 35% cost cuts for the clients as opposed to traditional law firms. Wow, and any investment necessary? Um, I yes, mean, yes, of course. Yeah, do you have invest VC uh, kind no, of stuff? It's, it's, we've, we fully bootstrap ourselves. So um, wow. as I said, um, we've, we've had a, a career in law before and we've been, we've been smart to put some money aside, which allows words, us to actually... In other words, you know what you're doing. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, they always say lawyers and numbers don't go together unless it's to look at the bank account. Um, but in this case, we've been actually able to, to use the money we've, we, we put aside to then invest in what we do. What they traditionally say is a, a law firm as a structure is a very poor structure. It's the partners of the law firm that are rich because they drain the money every year out of the company. What we do is, we, what, with the law firm that we have, we basically put the money back into research and development, into technology development, which then enables us to do what we do. Yeah, so perhaps the difference bet between uh, you guys and the other lawyers around the corner is uh, you bring in some IT skills. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. We very much aim to, to become much more technology driven than we are now. Um, but that's a slow process. You, uh, you know, lots of people think and like to think about innovation in terms of disruption. It happens today and it's a tsunami and it's gone. Um, that's just not really the reality of the day and certainly not in the legal industry. It happens piecemeal. So you go step by step um, and you take clients along with you on that journey. Yeah. Um, but what we try and what we tend to do is say technology is an intricate part of what we do. And so whenever you work with us, technology will be there. And what is really important for us is the co-development and the co-creation. We really like to involve clients actively in what we do. We want their feedback. We look for their feedback. And we have um, quarterly and, and biannually um, sessions where we sit together with clients, ask for their feedback, what works, what doesn't work, how can we improve it, so that we can constantly drive that development. So they actually buy in not just into a service, but into a product where they can actually actively work together with us on improving it constantly. So let's um, move to Mendix, because that's what it's all about today. Absolutely. Um, have you been using Mendix from day one? Yes. 
and how did you know it existed? Well, we, we, we took quite some time before we started this venture to look around and to say, um, when we're going to want to change the business model of lawyers, then uh, we don't want to then buy into an old type of IT industry. Um, and there's quite a lot of similarities between legal and, and IT, if you look at it from a traditional perspective. IT um, development is often also done based on days or number of hours worked on the development. Um, and what we were looking for was a solution that would allow us to sustainably, securely, uh, but also fast, build that, those applications that we're working on. And one of those applications, just as an example, um, the corporate secretary um, uh, application took us less than 10 weeks to develop. Uh, we, you we did that yourselves? No, no, of course mm -hmm. not. <laughs> well, <laughs> why not? I'd, I'd like to, but yeah. you know, there's, there's many things when, when you're starting a company, there's, there's lots of things that you need to do. And uh, I'm a strong believer in, in, in keeping to your core skills. Um, right. And IT, unfortunately, is not one of my core skills. I understand a bit of it, but not, not the intricate part. So what we did was we, we surveyed the market and looked for where can we find um, good, secure, strong platforms that are in, in, a, in a strong development um, path um, that have good and, and ample available developers on it. And so we, we, kinda, we looked at lots of alternatives. We looked at Mendix, we looked at OutSystems, we looked at other, other t similar types of, of platforms. Um, came to Mandix World in 2014, uh, I believe, um, where incidentally we walked by the, the, the stand of a Pronto, got, got talking, uh, we had a really good click and uh, decided to go for the first test project with them and Mendix, and that worked out particularly well. Okay. Uh, and so this is a, a collaboration that exists to, uh, to this date and it's, uh, it's allowed us to basically really quickly develop prototypes. We strong believe, strongly believe in try fast, fail fast, try again. Um, and what we also know is that a lot of these large corporations, when they go for something new, um, they don't want to take high risks. So they want to see results fast. So what is really important for us is to be able to come up with a, a prototype or a, a clickable version of what it's going to be and get fast feedback from clients to understand, is this what you want? Um, many of these legal um, company lawyers have had experiences in the past when they started IT projects where it took them four months, six months, nine months before they actually see the result of what they were asking for, which then often is either an over-engineered product or it's, it's disappointing because it's not exactly doing what they expected it to do. So to get that client buy-in, it's really important we can be fast and good at the yeah. same time. And that is something that we, we've been able to do to this date with Mendix and Apronto. Let's look at some of the apps um, uh, involved, uh, because um, I, I had the idea, um, you being a legal firm, that you would research the law, produce documents and all that. But do you develop apps for clients very much? Uh, we, we, we do, we do. What we, what we don't want to do is develop one app for each problem. So we've, we've, we've sat down with lots of, lots of company lawyers from larger corporations to kind of get an idea of what is the generic problem that happens. Okay, so, so an assignment may lead to development of an app that you can use for the rest of the existence of your company, so to speak. Exactly, that's what we're yeah. working on is, 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 in that case, more or less the Uber app for, for legal, but it's trying to understand what is actually happening in a business when it comes to legal and how can you build an app that actually has multiple applications and that you can apply for, for example, managing your corporate secretary work, but you could also use for uh, your distribution agreements or your bank guarantees or whether you need uh, sales agreements or you want to do employment agreements. Uh, there's always a kind of process that's embedded in how you work and legal is part of it. Um, but there's much more process. And what we basically discovered when we sat next to clients looking at what they're doing is a lot of what, they, a lot of what happens when you deal with legal work, it's about collaboration, it's about communication. Yeah. And we have a very nice example of one client asking for a change of a board member in one of their German companies where they were charged by a very reputable German law firm uh, 2,450 euros to actually get this board change affected, which was actually, in normal standards, a reasonable price. Now, the actual price of the actual act that needed to be signed was 154 euros, which means there's about 2,300 euros worth of hot air in that whole, <laughs> in that whole 
um, invoice you get. And where does this go? It goes into communication, email sent out, going back and forward. We basically traced for that one board change. And some profit probably as well. For yeah, the, there uh, were 53 firm. emails going back and forth between the client and the lawyer asking for various things, information, documents, changes to documents and whatnot. All of that is process related. It's got nothing to do with the law. And a lawyer needn't do that. A lawyer needn't do that. So, um, what else? L like the, the web interface you mentioned, that, uh, where, where uh, clients can come first time. Is that also developed in Mendix? Yep. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, could you sum up what properties of Mendix uh, make it fit for your work? Well, I think um, what, what made it um, uh, for us a, a, a quick decision to then say, OK, Mendix, a pronto, that sounds like a good match. Is, um, You've got the platform, you've got the, you've got the way in which it's built, the agile way of working, so the yeah. speed of development. It allows you to, to modularly adapt and to kind of learn together with your application what is really working. You can, you can change as you go, you can deploy changes quite fast, you can, and that is really key to us. Um, I've had experience in my past life as a lawyer with lots of IT programs. And most of them, honestly, really are over-engineered. And lawyers may use 10 to 20% of, of the capabilities of that program. Um, so what we tend to focus on is saying, where is the high frequency? When do you use it a lot? And that translates quickly. Um, but then also, you need to be able to change fast. Because things might change, but the core has to be, has to be strong. And so what we get with Mandix is a very secure, strong platform. Lots of our clients obviously also tend to be very sensitive in terms of security, tend to mm -hmm. be very sensitive in terms of where are the servers, how are my data protected. Uh, you can imagine that when we're dealing with lots of contracts, into also lots of internal very important documents about who has what powers, where, who is what, what director in what company. Um, uh, for example, all of their lease contracts in Europe, uh, sales management contracts, there's quite a lot of sensitive data in there. So they mind very much about where the servers are, how secure are my data, who has access to it, how does this application work. And I think where, where we also see that um, together with Mendix and Apronto, the, the level of security you can offer, the way in which you can develop your applications, that is a very good match for this type of industry as well. Yeah, yeah. And the apps you make, um, do they evolve very quickly? Do you have a lot of uh, version changes? We have quite a lot of iterations, iterations actually. Yeah, yeah, I think um, almost every six months we have, we have changes that we implement, things that we want to change. Um, and. It, it grows really fast. We don't believe in, in that you know, every week something new has to come out. <clears throat> but what we tend to do is really listen carefully to what clients say. And if clients say, and we get that from multiple clients, that this and that should be, should be doing that, or it doesn't make sense to do this, then we, we tend to bring that together and, and, and put that into development. Yeah. Um, is iteration the same as innovation in this case? Um, it might be. It's, it doesn't necessarily have to be, but it might be. Um, and I think um, what, what the, the, the feedback, for example, we get from, from a number of clients is that they, when they look at it, they say, it's actually quite simple what you do. But, and, it, and, and for us, it's, it's a big relief. And that this is, again, a key issue of what we need to do. Uh, whether you want to call that innovation or not, um, we're not that particularly worried about that. What we're worried about is, does the client experience a new way of service delivery that makes them happy and produces clear results. Yeah. And clearly it does. And so one of the KPIs for us in every application we develop is it has to be idiot proof and it has to be something that's nice to work in. So it has to look nice, but it also kind of, when you enter into the application, you have to have the feeling intuitively, what do I need to do? Um, and a lot of people still in, in companies today manage their business out of their inbox and their inbox folders. And so whenever that person then is out or leaves the company, you have a problem of business continuity. Whereas with our applications, you don't. Yeah. And that's also one of the reasons why, for example, Mendix is really important to us. It allows us to build those very simple applications. A lot more complexity happens in the background, but the client needn't worry about that. That's our thing. Uh, what the client needs to see is when that person isn't there, someone else can step in, quickly see what's yeah. going on. Okay, this is happening. Fine. On with it. 
You told me you develop an app in, for one case and then use it in many more. Mm -hmm. That sounds like scalability could be an important thing to as you. I, yeah, as I said before, what, what's really important for us is the volume of what we can what yeah. we can manage because that's basically what our business model is driven by. So th the the more volume we're able to manage through the platform. Uh, the more successful our business becomes. So what is really important for us is to think about how can we create an application that people can recognize as, oh, this is a tools for legal application, whether then it's to manage their distribution uh, agreements or their employment agreements or their real estate agreements, doesn't really matter. But it has to have that kind of simple same way of working in there. Um, do, do you know of anybody you have put out of business yet? <laughs> Being well, a disruptor. If if that would be our aim, uh, we would be looking for that. But uh, luckily, it's not our it's not our aim to put other people out of business. Um, you know, we 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 very much um, want everybody Let to, put it to, way. to make their money. But sorry, go ahead. If 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 all of law would start working your way, mm -hmm. how much less lawyers would we need? Probably a lot less. Yeah. Yeah. Have you done any calculations on the back of an envelope? No, but other people have, and it doesn't look good. <laughs> it doesn't look good. But it, not, not for the lawyers, but it would for the, for the enterprise, well, there's, maybe. There's, there's been a very interesting study by the University of Oxford three years ago about the future of professions. And I think lawyers was one of those professions where there was a high risk of being oh, journalists as well, a by bit the way. redundant. <laughs> uh, I'm, not too, I'm not too strong a believer in, in, in eradicating whole uh, areas of profession. I think you will always need lawyers. The reason, mm. uh, chief reason among which would be people tend to trust people, not necessarily technology, and we're not there yet. And I think people will always want to speak to someone if, if they're in a, in, a, in a tricky jam to get kind of a personal feedback, and you can't get that from a machine or a screen. So, and there's always going to be that kind of personal touch re required, which is also the reason why what we do is a combination of technology and people. Um, and technology will take over more and more bits as people grow more accustomed to it. Um, whether that means that lawyers will, will, will um, disappear, I don't think so. No. Will they have to adapt? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, anything else you would like to disrupt, by the way? Oof. Again, I don't think, uh, you know, we, we didn't start this business to disrupt, uh, to disrupt whomever or whatever, but, but basically we get out of the frustration that we had about how do we service clients and how do we want to do this differently. Um, I think if you look back at the roots of what disruption really is, it, it usually doesn't start in, in well-developed economies, but usually in, in, in the economies that are underdeveloped, where they jump from one to another bit and provide um, actually worse quality services in the beginning, but then climb the ladder and quickly climb the ladder so then you don't see it coming. I think disruption is a term that, that is risking to lose more or less its, its inherent uh, meaning mm. because everything and everybody seems to disrupt everything and everybody these yeah. days. Um, so what is disruption really about? I think for us it's really about taking a hard critical look at how does your industry work and how can you do things better and technology and especially I think also with what Mendix is doing in terms of IT innovation is a really, is a really uh, intriguing and, and an important um, um, event that's going on where we want to be part of it and we see the opportunities of using that technology to enable us to do what we want to do. And it's producing results. Clients seem to be very, yeah. very enthusiastic about what we're doing, so that's always a good sign. So you, you roll out a new model and maybe your model will become mainstream someday? Um, Here's hoping it will. Yeah. <laughs> Um, then maybe uh, somebody else might start to disrupt your way of doing things. Uh, b do you believe Mendix could help you be future-proof in that sense? Well, as long as Mendix keeps moving fast <laughs> and, and stays open to what's happening in the world, I think we needn't worry. Of course, it's a very important strategic choice for us because obviously what we do is closely linked with how Mendix develops. And so that's obviously a worry. And we have, we have lots of conversations, uh, and, and, and Bas from Apronto will certainly be able to, to confirm. We've got lots of those conversations going on about how is this going to work? Because obviously the scalability of our business and the innovative character of what we do largely depends also on the technology, which is Mendix. So we tie our faith quite closely into what Mendix is doing. So we have to closely monitor is Mendix 
doing fine. And um, I can assure <laughs> you that for the time being, we don't really have a lot of worries on that front. Okay, that's fine. Shall we f f try and find out if there are any questions? Yes, we would be happy to. Who has questions for Philip Corvelein? I have this mic. Don't see any hands now. No questions, I can't believe that. You're pointing that way. Ah! It's the light. There you go. Please uh, tell us who you are. Yeah, I'm uh, Vincent. I'm working as a legal counsel for Memdix. Um, and I was w wondering if your tool would enable us to uh, have uh, notary services included in the near f future. Notary services included? Well, we actually already provide those today for clients. Um, there's a, a bit more of a boring part of, of, of the legal business, but uh, a lot of companies still do require stamps and signatures fr by notaries. Um, and we currently have, I think, about 40 individual um, instructions running through our tool of clients needing extracts that are apostilled, uh, stamped, or certified by notaries. And this is a service we offer today already. So it's a, and it, it, it works really well. It's again, it's fixed price, goes really fast, uh, and it's based on your own platform. So everybody happy? A follow up question? No? Who else? There's one. Please tell us who you are. I work for an insurance company. I'm not a legal counselor or something like that. I'm a business analyst, and my question is about trust, the trust factor. You said I can automate processes, but uh, if an enterprise wants to do business with you, how do you build that people-to-people -people trust factor? How's the customer journey? Well, I think that, that is what differentiates us from a, a typical tech startup. Um, we, we, we made a mistake in the beginning of our journey, early 2015, to try and think that it was important for us to talk to venture capital and private equity investors. Because we thought, um, uh, having done a, a business degree, that that's how you have to build a tech business. You need to go out and look for money. Um, and then these uh, private equity and venture capitalists traditionally say, well, the way to build your business is to scale. And we need to scale fast because in three, four years, we want to exit this business and get a return on our investment. So the way we want to do that is then we have to massively push your product on the market. And then that means we need to start calling. We need to start marketing campaigning. We need to start. And immediately, we kind of felt this is not how we can build this business. Certainly not in this type of industry. The way you do build this business is through network sales, is through trusted contacts, through word of mouth, and through dedicated platform, where you go where the people are that you want to sell to. And so quite quickly, um, there was a mutual disappointment f between us and the different capital partners we're talking to that this wasn't the journey we were going to follow because we didn't believe that that was going to way that we, the way that we were going to build our business sustainably. And so the way we actually build it now is exactly that, is we go through network sales and we go through recommendations from clients. We're actually in the luxury position today where we don't have to go out and look for clients. Clients come to us because they've talked to another legal counsel or another company lawyer that said, I'm working with these tools for legal product. It's really great. You should talk to them. And then this is how we actually build our business. So it's a, and I, I, can, I can appreciate that there's not many company lawyers in the audience today because um, this is typically not one of those events they would, they would go out and seek, uh, seek information on. And were the venture capitalists very disappointed by this? Um, well, they will never show you that they're disappointed, of course, <laughs> because they will always tell you they have lots of other opportunities and you should be lucky they're talking to you. Um, but as you go along, you learn. And for us, it's been an interesting journey to understand how that works. But uh, I think um, it's never easy when you have to turn down an offer or when you have to say, no, this is not what we want to do. But essentially, in the long run, we're not here to build a business and to sell it off in three years. We actually strongly believe in what we do and we want to build yeah. something for the longer term. But how about all the market share you missed by not working according to their ideas? No, um, we don't know. We might, have, we, you know we, we might have missed a lot of market share and a lot of money, uh, but there's no way of telling. We don't have any crystal ball. Um, and and as, as we often say, if, it was, if we were doing things for the money, we would have remained a lawyer. 
<laughs> okay. That's a good point. More questions, please. There's a question over there, I think. Over there, yeah. Behind the lights for me. Please tell us who you are. Um, Mike Would you please Vizard, stand up? Mike Vizard with IT Business Edge. So won't this go to the natural course where you'll wind up building something that looks like an exchange and lawyers will bid for projects as they come in and that will drive down the cost? Because you're kind of creating a mini exchange that's closed, but an open exchange where all lawyers would participate in exchange and the project would go up and they'd bid for the time mm -hmm. it will take them to close that. It seems like that's the natural evolution of where you would go. Well, yeah, um, it 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 would it would appear so, but this is not what we think. Um, there are there are examples of that. In the, you know, I think the better examples in the UK would be LegalZoom, Rocket Lawyer. You've got. Um, You've got legal base is, a, is an example of that in Germany. You've got uh, Law Pivot, um, Law Gives is also one of those platforms where lawyers can bid for work. We don't believe in, in the platform strategy as such for us. Uh, the reason why we don't believe in it is because we can't guarantee quality. Um, and vetting out quality is, is an important thing, especially as you work for corporations rather than, uh, than individuals. Um, I think the second most important reason why we uh, think this is not working and why we want to be able to guarantee the quality so keep the platform of experts closed is, um, funnily enough, when we talk to clients, most of the times they say, well, money is, is, an, is an important driver, but it's not the main driver. We want to be able to save on our external legal spend, on money we pay to lawyers, but we don't want to necessarily um, push prices down uh, too much. We actually just want things to get done and have a visibility on what's going on. And so the pure platform strategy would be based around price mostly. So you go for the cheapest option. Uh, but the problem is how do you know what kind of quality you get? And I think there, because we aim at corporations, it's much more uh, important for us to be able to say, we vet the quality of the lawyers and we bring dedicated law firms. And so basically we have, in each of those countries, we have two to three law firms that have been pre-vetted by us that go through a very rigorous um, procurement process after which we then engage their services, uh, which allows us also to create a very clear win-win with those law firms because they know they will be our preferred partners for every kind of client we bring in. But we also have options for clients where there might be conflict checks. And these other law firms work for a fixed fee as well, according yes. to your model. Yeah. So by default, they adopt your model. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So we kind of impose our business model onto yeah. them where we say, don't try to maximize on each individual assignment. We will bring you the volume, and that will then maximize your, your revenue stream. And um, do they heartily agree? Some, or do they reluctantly do. agree? Some do, and some have to agree, because they kind of feel that the market is no longer accepting um, their kind of pricing. And, what, what, and is what that because of the existence of your company? Partly, but also partly because um, what's happened also is a lot of companies actually um, insourced more work. So they hired lawyers internally to do more work in-house, which basically means they need to spend less to lawyers or you have lawyers working in-house that know exactly how your business model works and tend to push down the price and tend to tell you, I'm not accepting this. Right. Yeah. So they feel that pressure and so they start looking for alternatives but usually don't know exactly where to find those or how to do it. And we offer them an alternative as, a, as an intermediary channel. Okay, great. Maybe one more question if there is one. No? Okay, that's great because time's up. Big hand for Philip Corvelin, people. Thank you very much. <laughs>